important to members of the, our community in the Midwest. In so the past few weeks, our, um, um, our members and our, our, our community association members and members of our community have been sending questions to us so that we can get a sense of what issues matter to you. Those are forms of questions that will be debated tonight. Because there were so many excellent questions, but it came down to finally deciding on which to propose to our minor candidates tonight. We can only agree on um, pairing it down to three. But we only have time for two questions. As a result, we're doing a randomized sample. Um, and as our debate proceeds, we've got to that just has numbers one, two, and three, and that will indicate which questions we can debate. That way, everything has a fair chance. Um, Yay, democracy! <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, um, in order to allow more discussion, we have also got the jar going, which Jack Meredith is going to be going around here. We have printed off the questions that we've already received from you. If something comes up to you, or if something comes to mind this evening before our, 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 our formal town hall commences, please flag down Jack, and you can write that your question, and we'll place it in a jar, and then those will once again be randomly selected um, to pose to our candidates. What that does is it allows everyone to have the same chance
Alexander's University lab instructor, a Victoria resident. He holds a BSc in physics from the University of Victoria. He is campaigning on advocacy and social justice, transportation, and governance. And finally, our last candidate this evening is uh, Chris Zabuda. He's a small business owner, a local businessman, uh, campaigning on civic reform, transportation, and traffic and public safety. And I think I missed, sorry, Rob. <laughs> Rob Duncan, <laughs> my good Rob's right. So I'll just speak to some of the production as well. We had a question for us. Okay, I think that's So Rob Duncan is a child poverty activist. He's a Victoria resident. He holds a PhD in psychology from Waterloo water University. And Rob has been leaning on affordable living, social justice, housing, and transportation. So these are again this evening. David, David oh, Johnson. Sorry, David. Notes are out there. Pardon me. Job as moderator is probably ended tonight. <laughs> uh, so we have David Johnson also here tonight. Uh, David Johnson. David Johnson is an activist. He's campaigning on social justice and right to camp at the city. So I believe I covered everybody tonight. Thank you and welcome. So a little bit about the process of what we're doing here tonight, about the debates. So uh, about the debates, we have about 90 minutes in total for two rounds of debate. Uh, there'll be two questions which we uh, draw from the, the can that Justine has. So we, we will in a moment, we'll draw those questions. Once, you, once the question is selected, I'll read each question twice. And so we're, we're going to have two questions, two rounds of debate. So we expect 45 minutes each on each topic. The candidate will have on the first round, and both rounds, two minutes to respond to the question. So each of you will have two minutes to respond to the same question in sequential order as we as I, as I suggest. Uh, <laughs> there will be two opportunities for rebuttal on each question as well. So uh, the first round of rebuttal, you'll have two minutes to respond to any one candidate or any, any number of candidates you wish to. Uh, you have two minutes, and you should time wisely. And following that, there will be a second round of opportunity for rebuttal, and she will have one minute to follow up uh, with a uh, against rebuttal or response to any other candidate that has, that has approached you uh, during the debate. So in, in total, each candidate will have five minutes of their time, essentially. So we're going to try to keep you to the clock. And we have time to here tonight. I have this red folder. Uh, if you tend to wander off course for too long, I'll be holding this up and we're encouraged to move along. And then if that doesn't work, my colleague might pull up there. So I, I just wanted to touch again on the forfeit. So uh, during the book battle, so if you choose not to rebuttal, you certainly can't ask your decision. Uh, please keep in mind that if somebody does forfeit your time to rebuttal, it does not mean that that time will be added to the time you have for the debate, and subsequently uh, the time that you have to speak. So we're going to keep everybody to the five minutes they have, regardless. And if uh, everybody rebuts, we just move along or choose to forfeit. We'll move along quickly, uh, a little bit earlier to the town hall session, which we'll speak to later in the second. So uh, just a little bit about the town hall session, just in this. So uh, we allocated, this is important for members of the audience, we allocated the latter part of the evening tonight for town hall questions. And we know there's been a lot of interest uh, in questions and candidates here at the table tonight. And so we have a strategy by which I think Justine just mentioned, uh, where our colleague Jeff Meredith over there in the corner will be taking questions at the the jar. And to make it fair, we will be taking a question out of that jar. I'll be reading that question to the candidates, and the candidates will have an opportunity uh, to respond. In this case, for the town hall session, we're limiting the response candidates to a minute and a half. Uh, so we'll be tactful in response. And uh, I know it's, uh, it's going to be challenging, but hopefully we'll get through it because there'll be a lot of questions. And we, will, we don't want to get stuck in any one issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how we proceed with that. And with that. So. Did you ask them to say their names before you give a response so we get to know the candidates? I, I think that's a great question. Uh, but whether or not we take that up to five seconds, I don't know. I'll leave it to them if you choose to. They also have name tags. And I'm sure by the end of the night, we'll know who's speaking. So, so just a little bit about ground rules today. And you can see we have a lot of folks in the room. We have a lot of engaged candidates in the city of Detroit mayor position. And uh, so we want to be, first of all, we want to be respectful. So we're going to practice the forum, be respectful. Uh, whoever is 
completely holds the floor. That person has the right to say what they want at the time they've been allotted. So please respect that uh, and do not interrupt candidates on either the initial response or the rebuttal that they present to the other candidates. And this holds as well for the candidates. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll practice some decorum here and hopefully uh, this is uh, a success tonight. Uh, so, uh, and for the audience, and the big one is no hectoring from the floor and no interruptions. And, uh, I know there's a lot of energy up here, a lot of enthusiasm tonight, a lot of questions want to be asked. So uh, just practice restraint and hold everything for the end. And that includes applause. So when, when we're up here, if there's something you like, I encourage you, we'll, we'll have that applause for the second at the end so we're not biasing or an interrupt in the flow of debate. And we're making it fair for everybody in the room. The last thing I wanted to mention on my list is cell phones. And I'm sure these turn your cell phone off. Uh, so we don't have that disruption. But if you do have to take the call and you have this large foyer, so please take your cell phones, step up the foyer, a conductor call, and come on back and you're done. Uh, other than that, I think Justine spoke into the fact that if we will have a little bit of headroom, I think, a little bit of runway back in the evening tonight, so that uh, we'll be able to mingle perhaps on the lobby. You'll be able to engage our candidates one-on-one -on -one for further discussion. Uh, we are closing the building at 9 o'clock, and so my, from what I understand, we'll be done in this room at around 8.45, thereabouts. So that leaves about 15 minutes to tag, uh, you know, run up and catch some of our candidates and uh, have a one-on-one. -on -one. There's, of course, always a problem. And there's always a problem. So, without further ado, uh, let's get right into it and let's go see what we have made. Great. Great. So, I'm going to get really crosser. Number three. So to the candidates tonight, um, this is a transportation question. What are your goals to decrease congestion on city streets, in particular bridge traffic and arterial commuter routes? For example, Swamma Road, A Street, and Freightfarer Road in Victoria West. I'll read the question again. What are your goals to decrease congestion on city streets, in particular bridge traffic and arterial commuter routes? For example, Swamma Road, A Street, and Craigbar Road in the West. And for, we'll start off, I, I believe, we'll start off listening to the table, so we can hand the mic to, to Rob. Rob, you have two minutes to respond, and we'll move on the table for as we proceed to this question. And with the rebuttal, to be fair, we'll move this way, back to me, and then for the second rebuttal, back down the table that way. So that's the way we'll do this. So, Rob, over to you. Thanks. My name is Rob Duncan, I'm ready for Mayor of Victoria. Um, uh, I have a, a, a really clear plan to reduce the, uh, uh, the amount of uh, traffic on, on city streets, particularly downtown. Uh, I really think we do need to start targeting um, commuting as opposed to other kinds of uh, transportation. Commuting is something people do en masse, it's predictable, it's regular. Um, I think that's, that's where we should uh, address most of our efforts at the present time. Um, I don't think bike lanes are really going to reduce the amount of traffic that much. I mean, they will have an effect, but not that not enough people can ride a bike, and not enough people are willing to ride a bike during the bad weather, that sort of thing, you know. So, um, we have to take a different approach. My approach is to work with the bus system instead of uh, putting in bike lanes. Work with the bus system in an intensive way. Uh, make it try, Experiment with ways of making it more, more attractive and more, um, more appealing to commuters. Uh, and uh, get them out of their cars because there's just too many cars going downtown in Victoria. Um, they're, uh, um, my, my assist, I, I have a specific suggestion in mind, a specific plan, but I'm also open to other, other ideas. You know, I'm not stuck on this one plan. I really just present this as an example. Um, fair free buses going into downtown during the morning rush hour, going out of downtown during the evening rush hour, combined with rush hour designated bus lanes going into downtown morning out of downtown in the evening, um, uh, combined also with uh, a greatly expanded park and ride system, which I think is just getting off the ground here, in my opinion. Uh, so park and ride lots all over the place, as many as we can possibly find. Uh, and um, one, one more component would be um, uh, signal transit priority, so that when a bus is approaching a green light, it can signal light to stay green until the bus gets through. Um, with these features, we can make a bus system that's so appealing to commuters that they won't be able to say no. 
They'll, they'll, they'll be leaving their cars at home. That will greatly reduce the amount of congestion downtown. It will also solve um, the problem of parking downtown because a lot of the parking that, uh, Do I have a few, few seconds? That's it. Okay. 30 second warning. 30 second warning? Yeah. We can so next up, thank you, Chris. Hello, good evening. Uh, my solution is very simple. Uh, lots of traffic, uh, the cars flowing from the west, from the land for cold, cold here, whatever, uh, by highways. And then we have to do something to reduce the flow to the city even through the captain try to go into the great flower anyway to get to the downtown as soon as they can to be on time in work. So my vision is to create a bus line, express bus line from the west, from the landfort, special right shoulder only for the bus. The buses will be go maybe every 10, 15 minutes uh, straight from from 7 to 9 a.m. to ensure everybody can be on time at work in 50 minutes in downtown Victoria. So when you attract them, most of them, they can skip the cars and the parking fees, parkades, whatever something they cost, and take the bus. And that is my solution, and then reduce the flow all over the streets in Victoria. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mike Yagan, and I'm running for Mayor of Victoria. Uh, in terms of overall uh, improvement of traffic flow in and out of the downtown core, uh, first and foremost, I'm going to relocate uh, those bike lanes, uh, the $15 million in infrastructure. Uh, they're going to come out of the primary arterial roads, they're going to be relocated to secondary roads, and they're going to be put in with paint. They're not going to be hardscaped in. And that's because if we have a, a calamity, an emergency, we need to make sure that ambulances and fire trucks and police vehicles can get in, can readily get in and out. Um, yeah, the other thing we need to do is we need to synchronize traffic lights. The more we synchronize traffic lights, the less buses are held up, uh, the less uh, delivery vehicles, uh, etc., are held up, and the less road rage and frustration there is. And it might actually encourage more people to actually start shopping downtown again, as, as opposed to simply going to, uh, to uptown or somewhere else to shop. Uh, and then longer term, and this is talking longer term, uh, obviously I think in terms of the Bay Street Bridge, uh, that might be a trigger word talking about bridges, but uh, in terms of the Bay Street Bridge, obviously it needs to eventually uh, be replaced by a four lane bridge so we can have one lane for people turning left and another for turning right and then uh, the lanes for people going straight through. Uh, and then talking even a little bit longer long term, uh, if we can get higher density in the West Shore, as well as continued growth of density in Victoria, once once a particular West Shore has, has once they've made significant gains in terms of uh, higher density, then LRT starts to become practical. And with LRT, uh, we will get a lot of people out of their vehicles and commuting back and forth. Thank you. Thank you, Hi, thank you all for coming out. I'm Saul Anderson, and I think I'm one of your hearts, and I'm one of your ballot. Uh, great question, thank you for pulling that out, because um, I think I'm uniquely qualified after 20 years of cab driving to fix traffic. In fact, I know I can do that. Um, one thing, it's one thing in the bike lanes, and they're great. Personally, I would put one bike lane on View Street, and culminating at Bastion Square, and you've also provided some other infrastructure for supporting cyclists, like a safe lockup or a shower facility, for example. Um, I would also like to see a counter flow lane on Douglas Street uh, and a transit corridor on the old e and line. Um, we have it right away, and it's something that could be easily accomplished. Um, as for uh, lane use and parking enforcement, um, there's a number of things we could do around you know, altering some of the, the direction arrows that seem to constrain traffic and co cause bottlenecks and stuff. Um, as far as the West is concerned, um, I love the West, by the way. Uh, 
you ever drive up Craig Flower uh, at Rush Hour and they have these beautification islands, right? Which has a bus stop next to it. So the bus stops and you can't drive around it. Um, I would move the bus, bus stops 20 feet ahead, leave there. Obviously, I'm not going to move those islands, but these are simple things that common sense you know, approaches and things that I would do immediately. Uh, and everyone would get home soon and uh, every day for the rest of your lives. So, um, really, this is easy. And even if you don't look for me, I think the city can do this stuff. So, thanks a lot. Is the bell the 30 seconds? The bell the 30 oh, and I guess I should use this one, right? Good, thank you very much, Dar. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Helps, and it's been a real honor to serve as your mayor for the last four years. Um, the way that we solve congestion in the city and in the region is by taking an intermodal, multimodal approach. Not everyone's going to ride a bike. Not everyone's going to take the bus. Not everyone's going to drive a car, particularly people under the age of 16. And not everyone can walk everywhere. And so what we really need to do is focus our approach on making sure that as many modes as possible are as convenient as possible for the most number of people. I'm going to start with the buses. I'm on the BC Transit Commission, and with the plans that are currently in place, taking the bus from Colwood to downtown, once we build out the plans, just those currently in place, will be 30 minutes faster. And you can bet that people who are currently stuck in the Colwood crawl will get into the bus and take it downtown. And that decreases congestion coming in through Vic West, it decreases congestion coming in through Douglas Street. So buses are a key part of the answer. And that's just with the plans already in place. Mr. Zabuda talked about shoulder lanes uh, out to the West Shore and back, they're already being constructed. And the City of Victoria took a leadership role. We said we will go first, and the bus lanes are almost built right to the edge of the City of Victoria. Bikes. Not everyone's going to ride a bike, but 60% of people say that they would ride a bike if it was safe for them to do so. My acupuncturist, she lives in Fairfield, she's got two young kids, she used to drive downtown every day. We opened the Fort Street bike lane, and now she feels safe taking her kids on the bike. And when the network is complete, more people will be able to use that network, and that it shows in every region across the country and across North America, when you create a safe, connected network, it makes it easier for drivers to get through the city streets and to find parking. Thank you so much. And I do have a rebuttal, but I'll save my rebuttal for the rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you right on time. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you very much for coming. My name is Alexander Schmidt, running for mayor. So I would say increased bus service. I took a bus from UVic, number 14, to get here. Took me 30 minutes to get here, that's why I'm late. <laughs> so I would say more bus service, more on time, especially a reference to UVic. Uh, I heard, overheard some students, they had to say they would have to go sooner to get the bus because they have to arrive on, on time at 8 30 for classes. And sometimes the bus is another time, so bus service has to be approved. In reference to the call with the Langford, section, I would say I would bring you back to rail service. Everybody says rail service, rail service, and there's not, nothing happened. It's been for seven years. Billy or whatever, out of service. And there's the ICF who's trying to bring it back into service. And then there's more uh, consolation, nothing's happening, and then they say there's less, not enough money. I wouldn't pay over the rails. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Pay $50 million to get an upgrade. Then you have rail service. And not once in the morning and once in the evening. Constant rail service. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bruce Wiggin. I'm a candidate for mayor in the city of Victoria. I'm going to take a little bit of raw, a lot of salt, and put it release of on this one, uh, because this is, there are a whole bunch of obvious technical solutions that we're all aware of because we live here. So we've seen what goes on here. We do have to improve bus service. Uh, the idea of an integrated transportation solution is a phrase drawn, you know, straight from a planning manual. Of course, we all, we all know what that means. 
Um, I have included in my comments on this in the past that uh, paving the rail corridor, or those parts of the rail corridor that we can pave and use, will relieve traffic considerably. But the unanswered component of the questions from, from the candidates up till this point is what do we do about traffic on Craig Flower? Because this is in the center of the community. It's right out here. It has children playing right up against it. We're walking to school. There's another school over here. And it's a nasty turn on the Skinner. And it's just not something that you want through traffic using to get around. We don't want people commuting to New Royal or Esquimalt all along Craig Flower, or God forbid, all the way out to Langford or, or uh, uh, Colwood, even. Soon, way out there. Um, so we might have to do something about not permitting through theater traffic on Craig Flower during rush hour, if that's the community's view of what needs to be done, because that seems to be when I'm hearing the question that people are concerned about the volume of traffic on Craig Flower. So perhaps one of the solutions is to limit the volume of traffic directly on Craig Flower. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stephen Hammond, I'm running for the mayor of Victoria. I want you to know that I'm not running alone. Um, it was a year ago this month that a number of us asked the question, are we alone and wanting change? And as a result of that, we did a survey, we found a lot of people wanted change, and then also we did community consultations. With that, we came up with our principles, and from that point, we went out and we asked people who wanted to join us. And so there are four people who are actually running for council, because we realized to have the real change that we're looking for, we need more than just the mayor. And so there's Randy Joel, who actually, I mean, she just, she just um, retired from transit, and I twisted her arm to say we need someone like you, so I actually rely on Randy for a lot of transportation. Gary Albert, we've got Andrew Reed, and we've got Stephen Andrew. We thought if we had either Stephen or Andrew in the name, it would be easier for people. But we make up a new call of council.ca. Now, it's interesting when we're talking about transportation, because I agree with a lot of the things that are coming up here, but I don't want to pretend that as a person who's coming in as mayor, I've got all the answers. The fact is that we've got the Transit Commission, who is, who is um, tasked with looking at all the different things that need to be done, and there's a lot of good ideas that are going on. When I look at um, the neighborhood plan, and, I, and these specifically are the ones that I looked at about transportation, so there's a lot of ways that you want to get people to, for sure, use buses. And when we're using buses, we want to make sure that we're being really smart about it. Now, one of the difficulties, for example, with the, thank you, one of the difficulties with, um, you know, using the Fort Street um, bike lanes, for example, is that while they measure the buses, they didn't measure the meters. And so it's very difficult for people to actually get around. And, and the other thing that I think is really important is we are an aging population. According to the uh, projections, by 2041, 29% of Victoria's population will be 65 and older. So whenever we're talking about transportation, we really have to take into consideration what is going to be our new society. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Next to Arthur. Good evening. My name is David Arthur Johnson. I'm a candidate for mayor of Victoria. Uh, there's no denying the wisdom that's come down here. I guess I'm sort of lucky in that regard being at the end. Uh, I do believe that there has been some presumption of variables regarding prosperity. Uh, we have a hundred million dollar debt and we have this preconception that we're evolving into a, a regular city that, that we we. we we think we want more people coming, we want to build more towers and, and, and whatnot. And I think this is wishful thinking. That, that we can't start talking about prosperity until we are at least one cent of debt. Uh, because while we're in debt, we are owned by the developers. Beyond that, buses are a good idea. <laughs> uh, again, Bruce said that there are simple solutions and we all know them and so this is more of a, a measure of how I will respond and not so much a, how much wisdom I have on the subject. Uh, patience be with us all. Uh, 
Uh, and thank you all for coming tonight. Well, that concludes the response portion of the debate tonight. We will then proceed to the rebuttal phase. And so, Arthur, while you're down there, uh, as part of the, the process, you will kick off the rebuttal. So, you have two minutes to respond to any of the candidates' comments here. Uh, or, sorry, two minutes for the first round uh, for rebuttal, and then proceed. And I feel like a taking, a, abusing my advantage because. I don't really have a rebuttal, so uh, th thank you so much. Thank you. And that's your prerogative. Thank you for your comments. Next question is Stephen. Sure. And when we think about when we think about transportation and ways of getting people onto the buses, because of course that is something that we want to encourage people to do. There's already discounts for seniors and for students, and and again we have to be very fiscally responsible because 46 percent of the money for transit in the region comes from the fare bars, and then the rest comes from either the gas tax or the taxpayer. And, and so it, it's not an unlimited well that you can go to all the time. So we have to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're doing it because we are truly going to get people out of their, um, um, out of their cars or to other forms of transportation. Now, the interesting thing is that when you think about all the different options that are available for people, it's, it's got to be one of those things in which when someone, and I think someone has said this, when someone is sitting in their cars and they're on the highway coming in and they see a bus whipping by, then they're going to think, okay, maybe this is better than the, the convenience that I'm going to have just for getting in my car. And I was even talking with Andy about uh, Andy Joel, one of our candidates for council, and I was asking about well, what are the things that they're doing to entice it? And she said one of the things that transit is trying to do is to look at using Wi-Fi. When I was in New York for a very short time uh, this summer, one of the great things and also the that you find when you're on the transit system, or well, at least on the uh, subway, is that you can use Wi-Fi, either the stations or actually the whole system as a whole. And so being that, I mean, all you have to do is look at people on the devices tonight and recognize that if we can make it more comfortable for people, because you can't force people out of their cars. That, that's, that's, you've got to give them incentives for getting out of their cars because people like their cars. Canadians like their cars. And even the, uh, this year was the summer where there was more cars coming off of the ferries than ever before. So the thing is we want to find ways of encouraging people to get out of the cars and, and entice them. And hopefully there's a lot of different ways we can do that. Thank you, Stephen. Mr. Bruce. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm supposed to rebut directly what other people have said? Is that how this works? You can use the floor as you wish, but you have an opportunity to rebut under one or all of the candidates from what they heard in the last well, like most. So, um, <laughs> well, yeah, I'll I'll say, uh, one of the things I'll say to, to Mike is that uh, I don't, much as it might not matter to some people in Victoria, and much as you do, might agree with it, I don't think we pay flank for, in order to be able to afford LRT in Victoria by increasing density. I think that's a bit of a problem. Uh, actually, the development of an R R LRT line into town is insanely expensive. And I have to disagree with Alex that the, 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 the paving the existing route might be a way to take a gradual approach. Pave it, put buses on it, those buses work out, electrify it, put electric trolleys on it, that works out, ridership increases, then we track it and we've got a graduated approach to doing it, and it doesn't cost very much. It's extraordinarily cheap to do. We've had a, a whole lot of reasonably expensive solutions suggested by the people in front today. Blow out $15,000 in cycle infrastructure and, and just paint the line. That's not particularly safe for cyclists. Uh, my niece was critically injured in a, a cycling accident where the driver crossed the line on Douglas Street a few years ago and she lost over a year of work and still suffers from that injury. Uh, and she's a single mom working for government. So she's had a tough time because a painted line wasn't enough to protect her. We need to separate bicycles properly. Hard separation on busy streets is the most expensive solution. Separate cycle routes down less busy streets is the most inexpensive solution. So if we're going to talk about this, the, the paper road line is the cheapest immediate solution and separating cyclists from traffic. Separating cyclists from traffic also improves cycle or traffic flow because we don't have motor vehicles stacked up behind cyclists who have an equal right to be there. Thank you, Bruce. Alexander, you're next time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you very much. The first question I would like to ask all of my colleagues at this table is, does anyone actually know how much money has been spent to date on bike lanes? Because every single debate I hear about the $15 million that have been spent on bike lanes. That is not true. That is not a fact. There is no factual basis to that at all. We've spent less than $7 million, maybe less than $6 million on the two lanes. But biking is not enough. The original estimate for the bike lanes was quite low. And then we did public consultation. And we heard, we want the sidewalks fixed. We want street trees. We want benches. We want this to be a better pedestrian experience as well. And so we increased the estimates and we did all of the infrastructure at once. And the bike lane project on Fort Street and the bike lane project on Pandora Street came in on time and on budget. So I just would like to disabuse this notion that $15 million has been spent on bike lanes. It's not true. That's my first rebuttal. My second rebuttal, I totally agree with this. Uh, painting lines on the road is not enough. Would you send your eight-year-old down Douglas Street right now? There are painted lines there. I wouldn't. Painted lines don't keep people safe. The third thing is, we are the Transit Commission. We do have to go into office with ideas. We do have to go into office with plans. And all of the ideas that have been shared today at the table are really great ideas. And I think what we need in the next mayor is somebody who has the experience and the detailed plans to actually make these ideas come to life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Paul Anderson. Uh, thank you for giving me. I'm going to stay seated. But um, I guess I'm thinking that no matter how much was spent, uh, the bike lanes were ill conceived and ill implemented. Uh, there's certainly shouldn't be, there certainly shouldn't be one on the main artery like Pandora. Uh, but uh, having spent a summer living in Copenhagen, <coughs> probably the most bicycle friendly city in the world, um, I can see that you know, separate bike lanes are beneficial and necessary. And, and the network that Lisa has alluded to is a great idea, but it just needs to be put in the right place. Um, as far as getting people out of the cars, I think we can certainly encourage that by uh, increasing our support um, for car share co ops and things like that within the city. Um, that's, a, that's an easy way to get people thinking about it and saving a lot of money that they don't need to spend on car insurance and parking and the maintenance, and whatever, this goes on. Um, again, Craig Flower, I do not see us uh, eliminating commuter traffic on Craig Flower. Um, I can assure you from downtown to the six mile, it's probably four kilometers longer to go around Douglas Street through the, highway, the T TCH corridor. That is already overtaxed, overburdened um, roadway. So, you know, again, what I mentioned about the, the bus line and the bus stops where the islands are and stuff, I mean, that's a simple solution that's going to get move traffic more fluidly uh, through, through this corridor. Um, and people living in the Royal or Fountain are, you know, they're going to take credit for it. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, as much as I'd love to eliminate all the commuter traffic for your neighborhood, it's, it's not realistic. People want to move here. People want to live here. We have bedroom communities as far away beyond the you know. Um, so people are going to continue to drive here every day. We just need to make it easier and safer. And an integrated approach, again, like we said, alluded to between the transit, the cycling, etc. These are very, very <coughs> solvable problems. Hello, Mike Nagan, uh, candidate for mayor. Uh, first of all, uh, as, I as I highlighted during the CFAX uh, radio debate, uh, one of the major problems we had with regards to the bike lanes was the lack of consultation. I met with disability groups. Um, they certainly didn't feel that they had been properly consulted with because um, imagine if, if you're a visually impaired person, what a nightmare it is to try and cross those bike lanes. You can't really hear the bikes, they're going in both directions. Um, and for senior citizens with limited mobility getting in and out of those vehicles, again, very difficult and very dangerous. And I've talked to ambulance attendants uh, who have talked about, you know, with these, with these now relatively narrow bikes going in two directions. 
Uh, one recently dealt with a situation where they clipped handlebars and both people ended up very badly injured. Um, also the fact that ambulance drivers don't want to go down Fort Street. And think about it, think if we had a major disaster downtown, building on fire, people needing to be rescued, and we've got these curbs in the way while we're trying to get fire trucks and ambulances to save lives. Because, because that's what we've done to our major arterial roads. It was crazy and it was irresponsible. And I'm very pleased to hear that it's only $7 million because that means that's $8 million less wasted tax money than, a, than I've been led to believe. So I'm relieved to hear that number. Um, but I think it's vitally important that as we, as we uh, change, grow, and develop our transportation networks, and yes, multimodal, I also like, not enough obviously, but I do. <laughs> um, you know, we have to have problem for consultation and we have to listen to what people and these different groups are saying. And I want to just uh, make some correction on Lisa Helm's statement before. Yes, yeah, she was right. She made the right shoulder uh, 7 to 9 a.m. But from the base street in Douglas. So my point is how these people from the Langford, Westshore, Corwood can get to the Douglas and base street. That's why uh, my plan is to sit down together with the Sunnich and Westshore, Colwood and Langford all together create a shorter so people find out it's better to give up on the car and take the bus, relax in 15 minutes to be in downtown Victoria. And to be no issue with the park lines. This is not an issue. Now it's transportation issue and this is a very serious. And we have to solve the problem to stop the flowing all over from the west to Victoria downtown and bridges. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Rob Duncan. Um, and to start to you a, a, um, a plan to, uh, to work with the bus system to try to get people out of their cars a few minutes ago, last time I was speaking. Um, it's easy to criticize that, 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 that uh, idea, that plan as being grandiose and Expensive. Nobody actually did that, but I'll do it myself. I agree, it is a grandiose and expensive idea, but that's, that's the kind of thing we need, folks. Um, the, the, the whole plan is motivated partly by you know, tr concerns about traffic, but more, more so it's motivated by climate change. Um, the uh, the relu reluctance to engage in, uh, in big projects, the reluctance to, to invest the large amounts of money, admittedly large amounts of money that are needed to get us you know, where we need to be as far as our technology in comparison with the climate. I mean, that's the, the small thinking and the reluctance and the criticism of that kind of big thinking is exactly the kind of thing that's keeping us squarely on the road to oblivion as a species, folks. That's true. Um, is, uh, the time for small ideas is past. Um, Every 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 year, every summer, we have more more weeks with uh, with forest fire smoke in the air, right? But basically, the more, almost the entire month of August now is was a you know sort of struggle with forest fire smoke. It's been what three or four years that it's been like that now. That's not going away. It's not getting any better. Um, that and that's going to start affecting life expectancy in Victoria. In other words, your children and your grandchildren are going to live shorter lives than you because of that forest fire smoke every summer. It's, uh, at its peak of it's equivalent to smoking seven cigarettes a day. Don't kid yourselves. That's serious business. The time for the time for small thinking is past. Climate change is upon us, folks. It's time to move. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're here at the Secretary Ball point now, and uh, so you just spoke, so we have another minute to go down, and we'll proceed down back this way for a minute each, and please take this time to be back or provide closer remarks on this particular question. I'm going to talk for another minute. I'm calling for a moratorium on, on the bike lane construction. That doesn't mean that I'm against bike lanes. I'm actually very much in favor of bike lanes. I think they're an important component, a uh, forward-looking kind of policy for the community. But we, I think we, my, my, my call for a moratorium is based on the concern that while well, it costs 2.7 million per kilometer, I think that's about right. Um, uh, and that means we have to get them right. We have to get them right the first time around. Um, I'm calling for a moratorium so that we can consider some of the safety clauses. Also, we 
maybe rethink some of the routing decisions that were made. Um, uh, but I am generally in favor of bike lanes. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm not against the uh, bike lines at all, but just prefer the common sense with the bike lines. Those that we have it doesn't make any sense. I'm passing every day uh, Pandora and my Blanchard to work. And when the green light coming for the cars, it's only 10 seconds. How many cars can go to the 10 seconds? Maybe two, maybe three. How many can cars can turn to right in Pandora? Maybe one. And then what? It's green for the bikes. And no but single bikes coming through. Traffic is going longer and longer and longer. You know, that's why we have to make the common sense. Last few years, there's no common sense in Victoria. So, Victoria needs help, not helps. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other issue I wanted to touch on uh, was the LRT. LRT is, is never going to happen unless we have sufficient density. And it's far from paving over the West Shore, as Bruce suggested, because you can either build up or you can have urban sprawl. Uh, so with higher density, we get the efficiencies in terms of making the operation of an LRT viable. In terms of building an LRT, we would need funding from the feds and the provincial government to do that. That's the only practical way. But until we have sufficient density to to even cover the operational costs of such an LRT, it's going to remain, unfortunately, a pipe dream. And, that's, and the reason it's unfortunate is because time after time, the most effective way to get people out of their vehicles and, and into, on, onto public transportation is if you have some kind of a, an LRT or a SkyTrain or what have you, where they know, oh, yeah, another one's coming along in 15, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, what have you. That's what gets the vast majority of people out of their vehicles uh, and, and onto transit. Uh, thanks. Um, I uh, like to thank Rob uh, because uh, he's consistently brought some really great ideas to the table. I'm, I'm really glad he's running and I've got to know him. Uh, he's also on the front lines of uh, work addressing a lot of the problems that we're facing in the city. But anyway, uh, it occurs to me that the mayor doesn't really need to know how to run the city. Uh, we have a very well trained, efficient staff doing just that. Uh, so what I offer as mayor is a vision, um, which I don't see a vision of Greater Victoria being uh, espoused by anyone in particular. Uh, Greater Victoria not just better, but also amalgamated, uh, you know, among other things that we need to address. So uh, that's what all I really have to say on that. Oh, and why not a very cute little electric trolley at the end of mine? You know, we can paint it to look like the old rail, rail car or something. That would be pretty nice looking. Thank you so Thank you very much. I can't wait to move on to the next question because uh, I've decided I'm going to dress up as a bike lane for Halloween because I'm going to dress up. I am a bike lane. So for those people who at this table want to put a moratorium on bike lanes, it means you're going to give away $1.6 million in federal and provincial funding. We have that funding confirmed for Humboldt, federal and provincial funding for the bike lanes. So if you put a stop to it, say goodbye to that money. I want to ask all of us, when did we give away our streets? This notion that cyclists don't belong on main streets, that people don't belong on main streets. When did we come to that consensus as a community? I don't remember that. So the bike lanes are not only important for making people, making sure that people move safely. They're a way of reclaiming our streets for all of us. But they're more than that. We received an award recently from the Community Energy Association, and I want to thank Rob for bringing up climate change. He says it's the time for bold ideas, for big ideas. The bike network is a big idea, and when it's filled, when it's built out, we saw this time. Oh, that's it. Okay, well, I, didn't, I didn't hear a bell ring. All right, thank you very much. My name's Alex Schmidt. Thank you. Last year I was in Amsterdam. You want to see bikes? Go to Amsterdam. Yeah. There is a four floor, like for cars, parking cars. That's not for parking cars, that's for parking bikes. And all four floors. 
It is unbelievable. They have bike lanes. They have tram, uh, trains beside the bike lanes. They have buses beside the bike lanes. In and out of Amsterdam. And there's a big rail station. Constantly for us. <coughs> some, but not all streets, just as we don't allow cars and motorcycles to go down bicycle paths, and we don't uh, allow bicycles to go down rail paths. I mean, we can separate things out and have a truly intermodal system, but an intermodal system doesn't really mean that one mode of transportation gets to operate in all areas. The other issue that I'm concerned about, and I'm glad we have 1.6 million, because I think we should build more dedicated cycle routes that separate cyclists safely from motor vehicles, but I am concerned about the idea of big capital solutions because we've demonstrated that none of us have any confidence that the city of Victoria can manage a big capital project again. We have to solve that problem before we spend one cent on a capital project in this city again. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen Hammond. And um, two things. One is that regardless of what has gone on in the bike lanes, the businesses on 4th Street are really hurt. A number of them are. I've actually talked to a woman the other day who is right down by Wharf Street. She said, I've been 22 years at the shop. I'm 70 years old, and I'm shutting it down in December. She said, it is strictly because of the bike plan. So there wasn't consultation with the businesses there. So we've got to make sure that we don't have a system where some people win and other people lose. And the last thing I want to say is that if we were to pave over that e and rail line, now you don't need a lawyer to know this, but it, maybe it helps is the fact you suddenly open up the covenants on that and it's going to First Nations land and suddenly you'll have to open up all negotiations with First Nations land to go through there. Not this a problem, but just could be very expensive. Thank you, Stephen. Author? Uh, my name is David Arthur Johnson. I'm a candidate for Mayor of Victoria. <clears throat> all of my fellow candidates have been wise. Although it has been sounded like a council meeting, not so much as a mayoral, a mayoral uh, debate. Uh, I, I do find as far as things like the bike lanes and, and uh, well, they may think of also the, the no smoking in parks that has happened, is that there's been a, an imposed forward thinking mentality that uh, we, we think, we, we presume that there's going to be another million people in such and such an you know, amount of time, so we're planning on that, when in fact, we're poor. We're, we're really, really poor. We're, each of you is, has more than $100,000 debt. Uh, and so until we take care of that, which if you look on researching on Facebook, you'll see I have a comprehensive plan that, that touches all aspects of dealing with that. Uh, the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for that. This is our first round of debate on the first question. And I think we heard uh, a full spectrum of ideas from the candidates here tonight. Uh, you know, begin with multimodal transport solutions for transit, bike lanes, cycling, uh, systems and infrastructure to support the region and the city. And uh, so a, a broad number of uh, perspectives uh, that we had tonight. So, I believe we are now moving on to the second round of debate for the second question, and we'll have someone select. Let's see our, our question selector is going home for the Starting at this end, so Rob will have the first opportunity to speak to the slides. 
Question one. The province of BC recently announced funding for what child care? Some parts of Victoria, such as Red West, are facing child care crisis. What solutions will you bring to help alleviate this concern? <coughs> I'll read the question again. The province of British Columbia recently announced funding for more child care. Some parts of Victoria, such as Vic West, are facing a child care crisis. What solutions will you bring to help alleviate these concerns? So we have two minutes each to respond to this question, and we'll start with Bob. Thanks. Um, child care is actually a part, part of my platform. Um, uh, I'm calling for a municipal affordable child care program, um, targeting first um, uh, working low-income single-parent families. Um, and expanding from there as funding becomes uh, available. Um, I'm surprised to hear that uh, that Big West in particular has a has a has a child care crisis because it seems to me that the availability of child care is so low in Victoria that it's a community wide crisis. I mean, there's a child care just around the corner from where I live in Fernwood, and I'm imagining people coming from all over the region bringing their kids there, not not people from Fernwood. I mean, that's how severe the problem is. There's an availability crisis. There's also an affordability crisis. Um, market price childcare is just unrealistic for for, for lower lower class working families. For sure, it's, it's a big question. Um, and what we need is um, is a, a government uh, government run program. Um, I, I'm actually in favor of the big picture in the long run of incorporating childcare into the public education system um, because it is. It is education. That's where education begins, is with child care. Um, we should formalize it and build it into the school system. Just as we, um, just as the, uh, the, the university system is, uh, is you know, really, in terms of uh, structure and so on, it's part of the public education system. It's largely paid for through tax dollars. Uh, we should build, build child care into that sort of system, too. Um, um, Many, 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 uh, many families pay more for childcare than they pay for any any other household expense except housing. You know, it's just crazy. And it's easy to imagine actually that some families could be paying more for childcare than they're paying for housing just because they have two kids, right? Right away, you're going to be paying more more than you're paying for rent or mortgage or anything. It's just crazy. The market pricing of childcare is completely unrealistic. We have to get away from it. The sooner, the better. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. And I just wanted to clarify, this is a problem that's across Victoria. We, this, this is a Big West perspective, and so we, we wanted to bring that into the debate tonight, and thus the reference to Victoria West. So thank you for the clarity on that. That is indeed the case. <coughs> uh, we'll move next to Chris. We have two minutes to respond to the question, Okay, I'm um, Chris Mundai again. Um, I would like to tell you that I grew up in Eastern Europe, and I was also attending the daycare at the time, and my mom was able to go to work. So my vision is to create a sit down together with the federal, provincial, and the city government to create a free daycare. Uh, because many families and single mothers struggling their life because they cannot go to work because we cannot afford to pay the daycare. So we have to solve this problem, give them their free daycare, and they can go to work, get out from the welfare. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Gagan, the candidate for mayor. Obviously, uh, child care, affordable daycare is a huge issue of, uh, in our society. Uh, as has been pointed out, a lot of, a lot of uh, people, especially uh, Moms simply can't afford uh, to go to work because by the time the government has taxed them, their take-home pay is less than their daycare bill. Um, in terms of uh, trying to, at the municipal level, trying to alleviate the situation, uh, one thing is simply making daycares an allowable use of your property um, and, and thus increasing the supply and creating less in the way of a bureaucratic barrier towards opening up daycare uh, spaces. But the other thing is, is I met with a client of mine earlier today, it was, it was a construction trade union, and they're talking about building a trade school. And one of the things we want to incorporate into that trade school is a daycare. Why? Because we want more women in, uh, becoming tradespeople. We want more young people full, full stop becoming tradespeople. So by having a daycare facility that opens up early, uh, you know, the, 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 and is there for the length of time we expect 
uh, those apprentices to be there, that they that their children uh, can receive adequate daycare coverage. That's the kind of innovative and integrated approach I would certainly support as your next mayor. Hi there, Saul Anderson, once again. Um, a lot I can say about this, I guess. Um, I, I think as mayor, uh, I don't need the money. And so it occurred to me that one thing I would want to do is donate uh, 25% of my salary to start with a daycare at St. Daniel Square or in some city property or something. Um, as um, you know, Rob pointed out, we should have something like this going on. But most importantly, I think we all need to advocate our federal government to create a national child care strategy. Um, if you look at Norway, for example, uh, they have four times our density in what, one in one, one percent of our land mass, but nonetheless, the most important thing is that they have nationalized resources, consequently have a massive sovereign wealth fund to which to draw on for a state housing bank, for early child education, and it's all free. So it's, it's a fundamental change here in Canada that I think uh, is difficult for people to accept, but ultimately um, there are enough resources to go around, it's just a matter of how well we share them. Uh, as a political economist, I can assure you that what it comes down to is, is power and resource allocation. Uh, and too often the elites are making decisions that are not in favor of us all. So, Thank you, Saul. Thank you very much. This is a really important question, and it is especially an important question for Big West, because when babies and big kids closed here, that was a very, very big loss of spaces in a very sudden way, and left parents scrambling. So thankfully, um, when uh, about a year and a half ago, the um, child care providers came to me and they said, Mayor, we know this isn't your issue, but can you help us? And so we gathered everybody together around a table, all the child care providers, the school district, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Island Health, the province, and we created a child care solutions computer. And we came up with a plan that would be ready for funding when the provincial government in its provincial budget this past year announced funding. And so I'm happy to report or announce, although it's been in the paper recently, so it's not really an announcement today, that as of September 2019, there'll be 75 new child care spaces right here in Big West as a result of the child care solutions we're doing. And we're doing it by working together. We're doing it by the Big West Elementary School having a modular learning studio that's going to be on the site there for 45 spaces. And we're doing it again by working with the school district and the school by putting up a divider in the gym so that the gym can be used for out of school care. So that's 75 new spots in Big West. And I just want to tell you about the generosity of Victoria the generosity of the child care providers. We were all sitting around the, ta around the table together, and then babies and big kids closed, babies to big kids closed. And all of the other providers said, yes, there's a shortage in our neighborhood too, but we want to prioritize Big West as the first neighborhood for funding. And so we start with Big West, then we move to Fairfield, then we move to James Bay, then we move to Fernwood. And so it's not just 75 spots in you know, Big West that have been created as part of the child care solutions working group but 45 spots per year in each neighborhood in the city over the next four years. So thank you very much, and thanks to the child care providers who said, Mayor, we need your help. Thank you, Lisa. And just to remind the audience, please keep your applause at the end. I, I know you're passionate, but I just wanted to have to reinforce that. Thank you. Alexander, you're going to stop for two minutes. Thank you very much. My hand's out on the uh, There was, yeah, the good news was problems announced funding for more uh, child care. And when he stretched the funding, especially in regions like the West, I would build a suggestion from the person that James Bay debates a while back. I knew that Bob Duncan was also impressed with it. Briefly, let us explore the possibility of interested seniors volunteering their help in daycare centers. It would be under the direction of certified child care workers. It's a win win option. Children will get more supervision. For some, the only grandparent figures came with all. Seniors would benefit in the obvious ways to a new sense of purpose. We are a society would benefit from happier children, more engaged seniors, and more bang for the buck from the promised funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Bruce? Uh, Bruce 
first appointing candidate for mayor, I once considered a country music career um, because I was a single parent, uh, not working because I had broken my back in a car accident, uh, with two children living in rental housing. So I've actually been there, done that, and I know how hard it is. Um, I'm not the mayor yet, but I've already started building a daycare. Uh, as Executive Director of Family Services of Greater Victoria, in partnership with Victoria and Women Refugee Center, the Executive Director of the President Board is somewhere here. Uh, we bought the old MS building in North Park for two and a half million, I think it was, and we converted it into a permanent resource for nonprofits in the city of Victoria. We obtained a grant from the provincial government and we're building a daycare with 22 spots that will open up in the spring. So, I've already started work on this and I'm not in office yet. Please do not call them. They're not taking anybody from waiting list until March. Please, they, every time I announce that, they get a whole bunch of phone calls and they get quite upset at me, but I'm not going to keep it a secret because it's an achievement of which I'm very, very proud. So, one of the other issues we face in some of the comments we've made about daycare, I am not dropping my kids off just anywhere. Daycare has to be quality. Daycare has to be inspected by DHUB because it's a critical, a critical issue in maintaining the safety of our children. Daycare actually has to be run by people who are trained to provide daycare services. I am not handing my well, it will be my grandkids next, but my grandkids off to people who are not trained to take care of children. So these small scale, cheap solutions that are temporary are not what we need. We need institutional solutions that we can actually afford to implement, and as I said, already. Steve. Hello, Stephen Hammond. The province, as mentioned, is coming up with a billion dollars for childcare. And as a matter of fact, that also includes giving money for capital expenditure, capital costs. So that'll go a long way. And it would actually be nice if the $9 million that is for housing and low-cost housing, um, that would be nice if we could also allocate some of that money for childcare. But here's one of the things, you know, there's only so much that the city can do, but but what the city can do is they can ensure that with the building boom that is going on in the city, that we get proper amenities from the development. <laughs> and that standard stuff that you find all over Canada, in especially these places, these big cities, where it's booming. Um, the difficulty is this mayor and council has chosen not to ask for much in the way of the amenities. Yeah, a few things here and there. But in the scheme of things, when you compare us to other cities, we it is, it is, it is horrifying, actually, when all that money is being left there. And when you talk to developers, they'll actually say, look, we know we build that into the cost, and, and so, but I'm not handing it over if they're not asking for it. And that becomes very, very different. So we've got to, but the, all that money is lost. All that money is lost. And so it could go to things like parks, it could go to things like this. <coughs> and unfortunately, we can't do that. So we've got to come up with a plan. Uh, we say to the developers, say to the developers, here is the amount that we want from you. It's negotiated. You, you don't want to come up with an amount in which they're not going to build because it's too much. But then they build it into the price of the land. And what we've got now is that when, when developers go to the city and they ask for more than the zoning allows, then the city eventually, and what has happened here, is that the city then approves it. So you are literally raising the price of land in the city because the developer knows Pay more for it, because I'll get what I want, which is well over what was allowed before. So if you want to talk about affordability for childcare, that's a big part that we can make a change, and I'll be part of doing that. Thank you, Stephen. David, you're next up. My name is David Arthur Johnston. Uh, as, as far as Big West is concerned, I'm, I'm sorry I, I don't know the political ins and outs of, of this community. I do know that community in general is going to have to be promoted. Uh, I have an idea. Uh, it, it may seem whimsical at first. I would like to see uh, a challenge made to the public with a reward of some, something you know, mildly substantial that someone would like to win, <laughs> where you would take, uh, tell them that 10% of this funding, I, I don't know how much this funding is, uh, uh, Stephen said a billion dollars, but I don't know if it's that, that's just for the entire problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you take 10% of the money that's allotted to Victoria, this is, this is what you would challenge people with. 
and assess all of Victoria's assets, its buildings, whatnot, and its gear, and tell people, look, put together a proposal that takes these things into account. 10% of that offering and the city's assets and buildings and gear and space. And what can we come up with that? I think Victorians would get a kick out of it, and I think you could see some really creative ideas. Because right now we need to be thinking about how to do things without money. Thank you. And David, I think I'm putting you on the spot again because we are now entering the rebuttal stage. So if you choose to take a little two minutes, you may. Again, my name is David Arthur Johnston. And as far as child care is concerned, it, it, it may seem off, off to the side or, or not, not quite on the target. But I do have a plan of maybe not eliminating, but drastically reducing the amount of hard drugs on the street and making the street safer. And so with, with those considerations, that it may give a little elbow room for possibilities. Uh, as far as someone feels a little safer at night, they can go to a daycare that's you know further past the place where they you know previously wouldn't be able to walk by. Uh, patience be with us. Thank you. Thank you, David. Stephen Hamm, two minutes. Thank you. When we think about childcare, the reason why it is, it is so fundamental for parents is because of the cost. And the costs in the city are just so great. We, we see it in every business section, in the, in the front pages of, of the main section of the newspapers and on social media. The information tells us that, that this is a very expensive city. So when you think about what can we do to make sure that parents don't have it so expensive, is that we can, as a city, those few areas where it's not the province, where it's not the feds, where can we have an impact? And it was just last week where I was reading in the paper that the, that the council was being asked to come up with $750,000 more um, than what they originally give. And this is for grants that are given to, um, these are called affordable housing grants. And so the city actually gives $10,000 per door for, uh, uh, for um, services and social service agencies who actually come up with affordable housing. So they work on capital projects and whatnot. And the mayor and, and council were saying, gee, that's another $750,000. Where are we going to get that money? Well, I would suggest that I could pledge to give that $750,000 because I won't be spending $180,000 on painting um, uh, puzzles on, on Yates Street that, that peel within a year. I also won't be spending found out um, just today, I won't be spending over $800,000 on the investigation that it took for the Ellsner Inquiry. And so if you actually have conversations with people and you tell them the truth and you don't have to get into all these very big expenses, I won't be wasting your money so that we can actually give more grants and so that can help out more parents and therefore childcare might be a little bit easier for them. Thank you, Stephen. I just want to remind the panel that we are talking about child care, so, but use the time as you will. It's child care still? <laughs> um, or other. Well, I, I, I'll, we can be talking about a bunch of other issues because in the city of Victoria, we have lost a lot of institutional properties. We've lost the Catholic School in Hamburg, that was St. Andrews, correct? St. Andrews? We lost the Truth Center, we've lost other facilities that exist within the city, some of which actually provided daycare space, and it's been zoned over to developers to build large houses, the fact that large millionaire residences for people from Alberta or Hong Kong or whatever. The, the problem is, is that when we give up on that kind of zoning, we create a crunch for nonprofits that, and for daycare providers and for everybody else that is very, very difficult to meet. We can zone within the law, we can zone usage on property, and we can say, no, you cannot build condos here for Albertans. You actually have to leave this as institutional zoning for schools, for churches, for daycares, for community resources, for the YMCA, for the Boys and Girls Club, for all of these other usages. We can zone for that. And these cities do, and they won't shift that zoning for other purposes. 
This is why, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this because it's such an amazing thing. 15,000 square foot building that I bought last year for three and a half million dollars, zero down. That was stressful. And we renovated it into a permanent home for family services in the Victoria Immigrant and Refugee Center. We have room for another couple, or, and pardon me, the Oasis Society is in there as well. We're developing a 3,000 square foot daycare, and it's going to be the first daycare in British Columbia that exists for shift workers. It's going to have a daycare that can deal with traumatized kids because between births and family services, we have a dozen skilled child counselors. It's going to be an amazing thing. It takes some imagination and some hard work. I was tiling floors here over Christmas myself. So we can do this. And we doesn't need huge capital projects. Sometimes it doesn't even need the involvement of the city. It involves the work to do it and at least the cooperation of the city by not zoning public resources over to millionaire developers. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Alexander, two minutes. Okay. Thank you, Dar. Big West. I apologize. I know the topic is childcare, but I am, a, I guess I'm a little bit old fashioned, uh, and I believe that facts still matter. <laughs> so I'm going to start with some facts. Um, the St. Andrew's property that Bruce just referred to wasn't um, sold and not building condos for rich Albertans. It's 172 rental units right in our downtown. I think that's a good thing. This notion that $180,000 of public money was spent painting puzzle pieces, that is sheer nonsense. The business community came to us and they said, we have $120,000, we'd like to do something in the downtown. Two business groups, they each had $60,000, they said, will you match us? We said, yes, we will, because Downtown Victoria Business Association, we believe in you. These are important facts. What has happened in the city in the last few years is for the first time in 30 years, we've actually seen rental housing be built. And when condos are built, developers aren't getting zoning for free. There have been millions of dollars of contributions to the Heritage Fund, to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, to the Downtown Public Ground Improvement Fund. So again, especially in election campaign, Facts are really important. Do we have more to do on affordability? Absolutely we do. And that's why we're working with the school district. And I have to tell you, the school board trustees who are on there right now, they have been amazing to work with. We're working with the school district. We've taken a piece of public <coughs> land co-owned by the city and the school district behind the Burnside School, partnering with Pacifica, the school district. We're opening 80 units of housing there for families and new childcare spaces. And we're looking at what else we can do with city-owned land for child care and for housing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Saul Anderson. Thanks. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Um, well, uh, thank you by saying that one of my favorite things about running for office is that it's a learning experience. Uh, you put your uh, you put your name on the city website, and your inbox is certainly inundated uh, with a lot of questionnaires and whatnot ultimately have helped me refine my focus and understanding of a lot of issues. Like, I wasn't familiar with the pet responsibility bylaw, uh, or the tree preservation bylaw, or what creative ideas to increase the tree canopy in Victoria. So I called an arborist friend of mine, and uh, he said, well, we should bend a green roof on the new buildings. Brilliant. Uh, there's a harm reduction questionnaire, so I called my a good friend of mine, a Big West resident, He's actually at a harm reduction conference in Edmonton this weekend. I, I wish I could remember everything he had to say because, wow. Um, as far as childcare is concerned, um, I like David's approach of enlightened austerity. What can we do for low cost or no cost to solve some of our uh, pressing problems? Um, and the, as I was saying, the best idea I think around childcare came to me from uh, a question at the James Bay New Horizons. Um, where someone suggested uh, putting daycares in senior homes. And two days later, there was an article in the Toronto Star, I posted on my Facebook page, if you're following me, which I'm going to uh, which said how great, great that is. So, I mean, that's a simple solution that I think has benefits, obviously, to the seniors, to the children, to the community. Um, and it's easy. We could do that very simply and for virtually no money. So, away we go. Thank you, Saul. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, in my platform, if you go to vote by Premier.ca, I spend a lot of time focused on the needs bill, low income, mixed income, and co-op housing. And I would certainly see uh, the provision of uh, daycare spaces, daycare facilities in those developments as also being of critical importance. But the other thing I talk about in my platform is providing free annual uh, rec center passes to kids 18 and under. Now this is an idea that has been picked up by not one, but two different slates of candidates running in Surrey. They have a serious gang problem in, in Surrey. And this is one way where we can get kids, particularly those from you know poorer backgrounds, uh, instead of tagging buildings and keying cars, uh, or doing you know what's referred to as crime support boredom, instead they can get down to the rec center, they can go for a swim, they can be with their friends uh, that they know from school and not be excluded because they can't afford an uh, admission fee. I think that's how we have a healthier, happier city, is by having healthier, happier kids. Chris, good again. Uh, I still promote, you know, free daycare in Big West and our Victoria. Uh, everybody knows because I'm the small business owner, uh, we have the shortage of labor lately. And can you imagine how many people, how many single mothers and low income families stay on welfare because they don't know what to do with the child? So, um, why we cannot help them out? If you calculate the cost of the welfare we spend on it and calculate the cost of the daycare, free daycare, maybe we can get even. <laughs> so why we cannot invest in our charge, not instead of the pipelines, seven million dollars, right? Thank you. Point out this point here at the end of the table, you'll have up to three minutes to see, see how you have the next one. One, two, three, okay. <laughs> um, uh, one of the advantages of government-run childcare uh, is that it, it's generally high quality childcare. And as Bruce pointed out, it's really important that childcare be high quality childcare. There's actually a big, a big research literature showing that uh, low quality childcare has distinctly negative effects on children's development. Uh, whereas high quality childcare has distinctly positive effects. Uh, it's, uh, positive effects on intellectual development, positive effects on social development as well. Um, yeah, but high quality childcare is expensive. Um, uh, and more than ever before, uh, as luck would have it, uh, a lot of funding is available from both the provincial government and the federal government for childcare. Um, the, uh, uh, so I, uh, money for child care shouldn't have to come out of municipal, um, municipal <coughs> taxes or anything like that. It's available from other levels of government. Um, and there are actually uh, cities across the country who have been providing municipal child care programs for decades. Uh, they've been doing it in the city of Toronto since the 1950s. So there's nothing preventing it. People are doing it all over the place, and we should get on it. Contribute to solving this crisis in our community. Um, uh, the federal program is called the Multilateral Framework on Child, I believe it's called the Multilateral Framework on Child Care. Um, there's actually nothing multilateral about it. They make it sound like this grand national program. It's not. It's a bunch of bilateral agreements with the provinces. It's a piecemeal approach. It's not a national program. Um, I couldn't find a specific name for the provincial program, but the, the federal program actually has a 10-year rollout, which is just absurd. I mean, these people don't seem to know what a crisis is. A 10-year rollout? You're thinking. We need daycare now. We need these childcare spaces tomorrow. Um, we need to get on it. Um, uh, this is all the tenure role, and it's also true of the um, Canada Child Benefit, which actually leaves more than three quarters of poor children still living in poverty while providing benefits to families making more than $150,000 a year. But it's not, it's really not an anti poverty program to look at it in detail. Thank you. So the format was that we would select two of three questions to give uh, an informed response from our candidates. It sounds like... I, I, I'm in favor of going to that question. I think it's an extremely important one. Me too. I have a rebuttal. And an apology. <laughs> <laughs> this will 
Is this something that we're going to have to deliberate with our organizer, Justin? I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of going, going to the next question because I, I do believe it's, it's the most important question here today. Do we have consensus among the panel whether or not that is the case? So could a show of hands, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think it would be fair to let Bruce have anyone who has a rebuttal, if that's not a rebuttal otherwise. So just to remind folks, if we proceed with rebuttal, then that will terminate this part of the debate with the move to the town hall. So we can ask those questions about housing in the town hall. Essentially, I would expect uh, similar questions to come up in the town hall question given to the audience. I guess, I mean, unless there's a consensus in the room that they want the third question debated and to avoid the town hall. Or why don't you ask the third question and we'll just all get an answer and we'll rebuttal. So that'll go clear. How many people want that? want the question? Thanks for asking. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay, well, so we have overwhelming support for the third question, and so I'll just frame the rules. What so, is the third question? I'll, 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 read out, what it is. I'll read out the question. Your patience is appreciated, folks. Let me just explain we have a minute left for rebuttals. I think at this point, if it's okay with Justine, that I'll read out the question, and each of us, and I'm going to start to drop down so we can be fair. Uh, we will have a minute to answer the three questions. Is, this, is that appropriate? Yeah, I'm just going to say one more thing. Um, please, everyone in the audience, do refrain from yelling out. And just have it in, in, out of respect for the organizers and people who take it out and being a very busy campaigning season, please do put up your hand if you, if you do have a question or a statement that you can't ask at once. Just as a matter of respect. Thank you, Justine. Uh, and just to bring us back, bring us back into the second question, I'll then, after, I will read the question twice, and each candidate will have a minute to respond to it. So this is the, the housing question. Thank you. So number two, the majority, 60% of Victoria's residents are resident renters. However, the city currently has a vacancy rate of less than 1%. Rentals also face rising costs, and in particular, a lack of pet family and multi-bedroom units suitable for growing families. If you are up in there, what will you do to ensure that the residents of Victoria have access to affordable, safe, and well-maintained family housing? That is for children, seniors, and pets, and others. I'll read the question again. The majority, 6%, of Victoria's residents are renters. However, the city currently has a vacancy rate of less than 1%. Renters also face rising costs and, in particular, a lack of pet friendly and multi-bedroom units suitable for growing families. If you are elected mayor, what will you do to ensure the residents of Victoria have access to affordable, safe, and well-maintained family housing? That is for children, seniors, and pets. One minute. Thanks. Um, the rental market crisis is one of the three, uh, as I see it, one of the three main components of the overall housing crisis in Victoria. The other components being uh, the real estate market crisis and the huge uh, non-market social housing and homelessness crisis. Uh, I think in terms of solving the rental market crisis, we need to, well, a large part of the, a large part of the solution has to involve social housing uh, because uh, Rental, rental, rental properties to start profitable enough to motivate developers on a large scale, the kind of large scale that we need. So the government has to step in. Um, I think at the same time, though, uh, we also need to uh, work with the development community to try to get more of the kind of housing that the community needs, as opposed to the kind of housing that makes them the most, most money. Uh, we can require a, a component of affordable rental accommodation in every every uh, rental development that goes that goes up, we can also incentivize more rental accommodation on, on top of that, on top of what we're requiring. We can also introduce incentives. One, one simple way of incentivizing that sort of thing would be by fast-tracking development applications. Thank you, Robert. Thanks. Okay, my motto is uh, let's talk more action. <laughs> so, um, my vision and my platform is to start right away government housings uh, to build if any left land for government, if not to buy it by government and build it as quick as possible. And once again, a uh, solution will be uh, government housings. And my vision is on the ground level 
child daycare, free daycare, and then people can leave their child downstairs and can go to work so we don't have any short labor. Thank you. I'm so glad this question got asked because this is the reason I'm running in this race. We are sleepwalking towards a future of a city of only the very wealthy and the very poor. And if we're going to turn that situation around, we have to be innovative. For example, getting the province to greenlight building three to 5,000 units of student housing at UVic and Camosun. And once they authorize that capital expenditure, UVic and Camosun don't have to deal with months and years and years of delays from Oak Bay Council and Savage Council, Victoria Council, they can start building. And as Seattle has proven, once you get the vacancy rate above 6%, the, the, the rents that, that have been skyrocketing from 1100 a month to 1500 a month to God knows where next year, they stopped, they plateau, in Seattle's case, they even came down. So that's, that's one of the things we need to do, but you can bet the other thing we need to do, as the previous speaker spoke, is cut some of the red tape, because right now we have $150,000 being wasted on things like the step code and, and a municipality that takes nine months to issue a building permit. Thank you, uh, Saul Anderson, once again. Um, one thing that's become abundantly clear to me after 20 years on the night shift is that uh, Victoria, the city of 80,000 or whatever, bears the brunt of expenses and problems of the region of upwards of a half a million. Uh, this is not fair. And so I would ask you all to take away from this meeting that you, you go home and you demand more from the upper levels of government. Uh, it's not the city's responsibility to fix all these problems, and we're doing our best on a shoestring, let's be honest. Um, as far as uh, housing goes, apart from the affordable housing plans, etc., yeah, 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 what I would say, the best idea that has come to me in the course of this campaign is that we need to tie rental increases to the property and not to the person. So if you get rent evicted, the landlord can jack up the rent by whatever amount they want. Uh, this is all too common and is contributing to the problems we're seeing with gentrification or in lack of affordability. So, so that's time. But there's so much more to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when I was elected, it took uh, one year and cost $4,000 to get a garden suite approved. We changed that, and now it takes four weeks and costs $200 to get a garden suite approved. And garden suites are allowed in every single family backyard in the city. That's not good enough. What is clearly in my platform, and this is a specific answer to the question about pet, family, pet, pet friendly family housing, is a proposal to allow on large lots, and there are 5,600 of them in the city, a thousand square foot garden homes for families. Right now, the upper limit is 650 square feet, and they're only good for one person. If we build a thousand square foot garden suites in backyards, that'll be suitable for families and for pets. And if we partner with a modular housing company, the prefab folks, if they can build something to the city's design guidelines, and neighbors come together and build garden suite or after garden suite on their streets, thank you, Lisa. It'll be cheaper and more affordable. Thank, thank you. you. Alexander, one minute. Thank you. Uh, everyone's talking about rentals. So yeah, and the vacancy is one percent. Has to be increased somehow. I don't know exactly how you're going to increase that. I don't want to make uh, huge towers in the center of town that are 100 stories tall. I don't like that idea. It is all like in Vancouver. You want to like that in Vancouver, fine with me. So I'm against that idea. That must be a better way. In reference to uh, pets, well, that's the landlord's decision if he wants to allow pets or not. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Bruce, one minute for housing. Thank you very much, Mayor Helps. I apologize. I kind of wrapped up St. Andrews with the Truth Center for the fact that we keep institutional and institutional 
The other thing when it comes to housing and every solution select, uh, mentioned so far tends to rely on the market. That we're going to build garden suites, roll trailers into backyards, build basement suites, have con condo developers get cheaper costs to, to build this. We'll drop step code three and we'll uh, straighten out the building code process. That's all profit that goes into the developer's pocket. They're not going to take 80000 that they save on a place and give it to you. So one of the issues that we have to do is the city actually has to build the housing. The city has to actually build the housing. The city has to build the housing. It doesn't cost that much to build. Well, it costs a hell of a lot to build, but we can build three bedroom condos in this city still for about $300,000. 250 we get a ride. I'll take the coach, you can't. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, <laughs> I'll get an extra 10 on that one, right? Yeah. The, uh, take the, the, uh, <laughs> you, you broke my train of thought. Sorry. I think I need an extra 15 seconds. But at any rate, we can build this stuff and we can get uh, financing that allows us to actually have a city asset that provides a combination of market housing. We're at time. I, 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 did, I did give you 10. Stephen, one minute, please. I'm positive. Sure. Years ago, when I was living in Vancouver, I was uh, part of a group that started something called Measures of Risk. And that was when the renovations were coming in. That was when um, the provincial government was actually literally suggesting retroactive rent increases. If the landlord didn't give the assigned amount, we'd go back four years and you could get something of retroactive rent increases. And people forget that, but I was on the radio and television with all these other people, and I was fighting that. And then I was asked to join the Tenants' Rights Action Club in Vancouver as well, and I lived there a number of years ago. So the whole notion of renters and helping out for affordable renting is something that's dear to my heart and something that I believe in very strongly. There's a lot that needs to be done, and I'm afraid in one minute there's only so much that we can say. But maybe on the rebuttal, we'll be able to say some more. Thank you, Stephen. David, one minute. <laughs> I do have a few ideas, and I presume most of you would look at me in horror with them. They, they, do, they do include the tent cities, but I'm also very aware that tent cities do not work while there is an addiction epidemic, an imposed addiction epidemic, but I can get into that later. Uh, so imagine, if you will, student tent cities, ones that have a covenant of civility and peace, ones that understand that the, the hard drugs are not going to make a home there. You can't even imagine that you are, a lot of people already have a preconception that tent cities are a perpetual no. Uh, and I would say that that's prejudicial. Uh, what happens when you don't have to build student housing anymore? There's a pressure valve that you never considered that suddenly you don't have 2,000 people all going for the same apartment because they know that they and their friends can stay in this David? welcoming community. Thank you very much. That's time. Uh, I'll let you get So, we'll point to Parker here with our event organizer. So, so as I heard it, we used, that was the last rebuttal case of the, the last question. And so for time concerns, I'm looking at the clock now, it's 10 after 8. Do we want to come back? No, let's go to the town hall. Yeah. We will move to the town hall. Thank you, David. Uh, much appreciated, panel. Thank you for your patience. We will now move to the town hall session. And as I explained earlier, there we have a number of questions. Oh, go ahead. We're driving the bus.
for each candidate on this question. Okay, so Bruce. Bruce. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to realize that in a real democracy, we all have to have the right to try for any office. We don't have a professional political class in this country. We are citizens who govern ourselves. So having a professional, uh, a professional political class is not what we're all about. So that's the first thing, that you all have the right and the capacity to run for mayor. You all can sit up here, and we've demonstrated that very well, and people who you wouldn't expect to be able to govern and have come up with some of the best ideas that I've heard from the front of the table. I hope you agree with me on that as well. So that's one of the first issues. Secondly, I did have some experience with governance as a, a governance as a senior policy advisor across a number of ministries and provincial government. I've worked in municipal government. Actually, I've worked with recreational programs for street kids and gangs in Surrey for two years. <laughs> God, I was hoping for a rebuttal on that one. Um, so, I've actually worked in government in a wide variety of areas. I've, I've led nonprofits with tight budgets. Uh, I've delivered programs on time and on budget and on schedule time and time and time again for year after year after year. It's been part of my career. So, I think I can do this. I think everybody in this room can do this. And if one of you was running, I might not be. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Mike, you're up next. Thank you for the question. Uh, further to what Bruce said, um, after I graduated with my degree in economics from the University of Victoria, I was fortunate to be hired as a research officer in government. Uh, and then from there, I was plucked and promoted, uh, and I was a ministerial assistant in the Mike Harper government. I worked for a gentleman named Bill Barley uh, in the portfolios of agriculture, fisheries, and food, and then small business, tourism, and culture. Uh, and then I also facilitated the cabinet subcommittee um, and then after leaving uh, government, um, I did, for a time, live out in Langford. I spent seven years on Langford's Planning and Zoning Committee. Um, and then in terms of the consulting work I've done, I've, I've done a lot of consulting work with First Nations. I helped successfully lobby for the creation of the First Nations Finance Authority, which is modeled upon the BC Municipal Finance Authority. Um, I've helped uh, successfully lobby uh, to uh, save the West Coast uh, shipbuilding industry. Uh, we were able to get C-SPAN the contract to build the next generation of Canadian Coast Guard vessels. Um, you know, when, pa when patients came, uh, were, were waiting 13 months for an MRI, the doctors in Victoria actually hired me uh, to once again successfully lobby the provincial government for, for more public funding for MRIs. So I think I bring a wealth of experience, a wealth of connections, which will enable me to deliver on the very specific promises I've laid out in my platform. Thank you, Michael. I think it is naive to associate administrative skill with leadership. Uh, I can tell an intelligent person, I can see an intelligent idea. Doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not qualified because I haven't graduated high school. I've written a book. I've, I've, um, a wizard when it comes to dealing with being surrounded with crazy chaotic people and cops and people screaming. That's my environment. I know how to bring that to peace. And, and I also know that the things that this city needs to do, I might be the only one capable of doing them because I have no other obligation. I would be your mayor 24-7. Stephen Hammond, I'm a lawyer, and for the last 27 years I've owned my own business. And believe it or not, it's called Harassment Solutions Inc. And I've written three books, and people come to me over some of the most difficult issues we're dealing with. When Bob Paulson, the former commissioner of the RCMP, was about to be launching a hundred million dollar settlement of sexual harassment, he read my third book that I wrote, The New Norm, and he actually had me come in and talk to the senior leadership. I, on a regular basis, I'm involved in all kinds of difficult issues that I have to give a lot of people advice for. But you know what I think really qualifies me for this job? Is that I'm able to build and, and support community. When my neighborhood, a couple years ago, was being threatened and being 
um, and being inundated with the criminal element of the tent city around the courthouse. Not the people who really wanted housing, but the criminal element. And the mayor and council wouldn't do anything. People came to me. And I thought, why are you coming to me? This isn't my day job to do this. And then most recently, when the council made a decision a year ago, I actually asked a bunch of people, you know, am I alone in this, thinking that there needs to be a new uh, council? And with our new council candidates, and we've got well over 100 volunteers, and we've got hundreds of people who are supporting us on this campaign financially and with their, with their efforts, that I build a community so that we can go forward and build a new council, somewhere where there's real collaboration and real, real concern about your tax policy. I think that's a qualified. Thank you, Stephen. Are we proceeding this way down the table again? Or? Uh, I'll leave Lisa. Lisa Helps, and then we have Chris and we have Rob. Thank you. There are three things that uniquely qualify me to continue to be your mayor for the next four years. And the first is that I spent three years as a city councillor. And that gives you an experience that you don't have if you're not there first. When I was a counselor, I knew 75% of what the job of mayor was, because I watched the mayor do it every day. And I'll tell you a secret, I actually haven't told anyone this. Uh, when I decided that I was gonna run for mayor, when I was still on council, I made a word file called WIM, when I'm mayor, and I made notes to myself at every council meeting, what would I do differently? So I came positioned for the job in that way. The second thing that makes me qualified to be your mayor for another four years, and I hope that I've demonstrated this over and over again, is that I and my council have the ability to make courageous decisions, even when, and especially when, it feels hard. And whether that's putting in bike lanes so that the next generation of people can get around safely, whether that's responding to the requests of the Indigenous community, whether that's putting our stake in the ground and saying we are going to be 100% renewable energy by 2050, those are courageous decisions that we needed to make and we have the ability to do that, and I have the ability to do that. And finally, the other skill that I have, that I've learned in this term of office, is the ability to adapt and change my mind when I get new information. Thank you, Lisa. Saul, are you... Uh... Seriously ready? Okay, well, <laughs> uh, Are you prepared? I think I'm ready. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I don't believe the mayor really needs to know how to run the city. Uh, in consultation with staff and the community, I don't see the job as that difficult. Um, meanwhile, at its core, cab driving is politics um, <laughs> and conflict resolution. Um, moreover, I've heard altogether too much from government elites, policy wonks and party hacks among them, who have spent too long at the trough and only seek to maintain a status quo that is not working. So, uh, I'm coming at this from the grassroots approach, uh, and I really look forward to speaking with you all in person rather than the monologues that tend to consume these meetings. Um, please feel free to stop me in the street or yell at me in my taxi. All day. Thank you very much for coming out. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Saul. We're going to move over to Chris. Chris, one minute, I'll give you the mic. Okay, Chris Muda again. Uh, I'm the small business owner. That's the fear of Delhi for the last eight years. I provide to Victoria a Western Eastern cuisine. Uh, simply saying, like, I'm the pierogi guy at my pierogies. <laughs> and I'm disagree with the, that education uh, go along uh, with the guts that the mayor should have it to run the city. Uh, so remember that. Uh, you are the taxpayers, and you should tell me what to do, and I will listen and work with you to solve those problems. Thank you. My name is Rob Dunman. Um, I don't have any experience working in government, uh, but um, I'm, I'm going to echo some of the comments that have been made by other candidates here. I really don't, uh, I don't believe that there's a limited number of people in, in our community who can serve as mayor. Uh, I, I think any re reasonably intelligent, reasonably articulate person can do the job. In fact, that's one of the things that the term democracy means to me. So I really don't subscribe to that view. Um, I guess primarily one of my qualifications, I was 
thought I'd mention my academic background. I have three, three social science degrees. Uh, my first PhD is in developmental psychology. I was working on a second PhD in political sociology at the University of Victoria until a couple of years ago when the financing became impossible. Um, I have been an environmental activist since I was a little kid, uh, since practically before the term was environmentalist was coined. Uh, when, I, when I first identified with that perspective, the term was conservationist. I mean, that's how long ago it was. Um, I've been a social activist around town for, uh, for a number of years. Um, uh, I'm currently working in low barrier supported housing, so I see a piece of the homelessness crisis up close every day at work. And I'm going to hazard a guess that I might be the only, probably the only candidate here who has saved people's lives, lives with naloxone, uh, saved their lives from opiate, opiate overdoses over and over and over again, including twice in the last month. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. I'm just looking at the time. I'm wondering if you would reduce the response to one minute. Probably two more questions. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think you guys didn't want to respond. Alexander, we missed you. Apologies. Might be seconds. Uh, as you notice, I'm new to this stuff. I teach the kids at New Rick, first year, second year, third year, students' labs. It's quite interesting for me. And this is completely out of my field, but I'm, I'm going for it. <laughs> and part of the match is that I have a, a, a fresh face and I'm not wrong to any special interest because that for me, I, I, that I will do obligations other than to you only, the fellow citizens of Victoria, and that's it. So if you want to vote for me on October the 20th, then vote for me on October the 20th. And my website is www.alexanderschmidt.ca and I also have a Facebook. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Or to Justine and presumably for another question. Okay. All right, just one more question. Oh, this is a one. Uh, okay, for the transportation one, you can see why the yes. form one of our um, debate questions. This is, um, so what is your plan to bring more retail and small businesses to Big West? Business development question. Uh, how about we start from the center? We're going to So Rob, will take questions? Yeah, yeah, sorry. What is your plan to bring more retail and small business to Big West? I have a lost answer to this question. Um, yeah, I'm just going to pass on this. Thanks. I guess uh, lowering the taxes uh, and the rentals, the fees to you know, small businesses can exist in our big west of Victoria. Thank you. Well, actually, after I uh, left government in 96, uh, a few years after that, I was actually commissioned by the Vancouver Island Economic Developers Association to do an economic study of Vancouver Island. So I traveled the length and breadth of the Vancouver Island uh, looking at economic opportunities and making recommendations, uh, which was in a report, which is still available on my consulting website um, if, if you're having trouble falling asleep. But there was some good recommendations. <laughs> um, in any event, in terms of BigQuest specifically, as we go to higher density development, I think one of the things that's good as part of that is, is encouraging uh, ground floor retail and those, uh, and those kind of opportunities. And obviously, if we can solve the transportation problems, uh, then we're going to get more in the way. And when I say transportation, I'm saying multimodal, not just cars. But as we solve those transportation problems, we're going to get more in the way of people shopping uh, in downtown Victoria and in the Midwest. Um, and and I, I don't want to see that. I want to see that experience where, where people, uh, this is a city bustling with people of different ages, different income ranges. Fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Same for everybody. <laughs> 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 
Yes, thank you. Um, well, I have a small business, and uh, I understand very clearly that it's just those type of things that drive the economy. Um, overall, I, I guess I'm pretty happy with the request. Uh, you know, the Sparrow Cafe and Fry's Bakery and whatnot. Um, there's that new development in town by the West Bay that's a mixed use uh, retail on the ground floor and residential on the top two floors. So, you know, it seems to me that there are things happening that are positive. Um, how do we encourage that through the city? I don't know, starting more co op businesses or easing tax burdens or. Uh, and something that has come to my attention as well that um, numerous business owners in the city of Victoria pay a lot in taxes. Uh, and don't have a voice uh, at the municipal table. So that's something I'd like to address or look into and, and consider, uh, as I say, giving a vote to the, you know, all of the people. Taxation without representation, I think we know what might happen there, right? So, uh, you yeah, know, that's, that's my two cents. Thank you. Uh, when I took office at the beginning of 2015, I guess, uh, the downtown retail vacancy rate was over 10%. Fast forward until now, and it's below 4%. How did we do that? We didn't. The business community did. But what we did do is repurpose a vacant FTE, so vacant staff position, and repurpose an old storage area, and we turned it into a business hub. And we have a business ambassador at City Hall, and she's amazing. She's a small business person who now works at City Hall, so she knows both sides of the story. And she helps businesses open quickly. She gives them the support they need. She hosts small business workshops. And it just occurred to me in response to the fantastic question drawn out of the jar, is we are currently, she invites people to City Hall, business owners, to come and learn. But why don't we deploy our business ambassador out in all the neighborhoods? So that's what we'll do. It's her job to help businesses so she can come to where the businesses want to start. And we will also honor the Vic West Global Area Plan, which lays out a very clear strategy for the future of the neighborhood, including its businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Alexander.
100% of the businesses in Cook Street Village, 100% of them said do not put the bike lanes down Cook Street. And yet the mayor and council forged ahead with it, and it was after two years of fighting, two years of fighting, their time, their money on pamphlets, you know, talking to the media. You won't be fighting with me because we'll listen to people. We'll listen to special interests. That's important because they've got important information. But it will not be to the exclusion of everyone else. So that's how you can support retail and small businesses in Victoria by listening to me. Thank you, Stephen. David, 90 seconds. This goes partially to the congestion idea promoting an idea of living where you work and working where you live. Uh, I don't know how difficult it would be to create some sort of pseudo-commercial uh, license that residences could have so you could have a business being run out of your own home. Uh, that, that's my idea for that. Uh, my name is David Arthur Johnson, a candidate for mayor of Victoria, and gosh, Thank you, David. Uh, and uh, we're all set to meet that you'd also like to speak to this, so we're going to give him an opportunity for 90 seconds as well. Thanks. I passed morning notices. I sat down and thought about it for a minute. I thought, well, I should. There are lots of things I could say. Um, uh, one way in which I would support the development of uh, um, uh, small business in the Big West is through uh, encouraging the development of a walkable community. Um, this, to me, this means a more mixed community with uh, including retail businesses and employers as well as residents. Residences, um, services, all that sort of thing, all mixed together so people can walk to work and walk to, for all their daily activities, ideally. Um, another way in which I would uh, encourage the development of uh, small business in, in Big West is through uh, providing childcare for employees. Uh, again, so you know, they can work in their neighborhood, they can walk to childcare to work and so on. Um, and the uh, third way is uh, through um, introduction of a municipal living wage policy. Would uh, um, increase the amount of, the amount of uh, money in the community to be, to be spent. Um, this would uh, be, be modeled after a uh, living wage policy that's been in place in New Westminster since the, uh, 2010. Um, uh, it would, it, uh, the New Westminster policy applies to city employees and employees working on city property. I suggest expanding that just a little bit and including uh, employers of the city with, uh, with contracts with the city. Thank you. All right, Justine, no more need for a format. Do we have time for another question? Or? Um, I'm getting a sense that people are getting a little bit fatigued. So I've definitely been on marathon of the night. So I just want to thank everyone who's come out. Um, thanks for coming. Thank you, Dr. Earl and Lauren Davis, for your very advanced um, management of anything. Mm -hmm. um, and to Mike Bedlin, who has been our sound tech, Lydia Smith, who has been our